So we're going to hear now from two speakers, and I'd just like to introduce them. The first one is um, uh, Richard Host and Aaron Liu. Both Richard and Aaron are known to many of us in the room. They're known extremely well to, to myself. I've worked with them over many years on many forums, the CIO Leadership Group and this early incarnation. Um, let me introduce uh, Richard and Aaron. Aaron I've known since 2005. And uh, this is before he entered into IT. So it's only been in IT uh, for the last 10 years, but it's had a tremendous effect on the work that he's doing. So before taking up his CIO role in 2012, now Aaron is a CIO for the Department of Justice. And before taking up his role in 2012 and moving into the technology sphere, Aaron had worked in many sort of roles, both in the legal practice, uh, as well as working in, in uh, planning roles within his own particular department. So he has held operational and strategic leadership roles predominantly within the legal sector and the private sectors within Australia and in the UK as well. Aaron holds a Bachelor of Laws of, and Bachelor of Laws and Economics, Social Science, and is a graduate from Sydney University. Um, Aaron who was one of those in the young individuals which I was asked to, to uh, uh, spend some time with and talk about enterprise architecture while he was uh, making his uh, inroads into uh, CIO ranks. And he's taken the concept right now to a totally different level. So I'm keen to hear uh, on Aaron's journey and how he has actually taken on board the postmodern approach as well as the adaptive sourcing. Richard host, R Richard challenges us in many ways. <laughs> and, um, and we like Richard's energy and his vigor. So let me tell you about Richard. So Richard is a CIO <laughs> from Fire and Rescue in New South Wales. And he came from the private sector before he came into government, and, uh, and I like that because that really challenges our status quo as well. Um, Richard's organization is responsible for preventing and responding to fire, chemical, road emergencies, protecting over 90% of the state's population. So his solutions that he needs for his organization needs to work, and needs to work all the time. Richard has this concept of work anywhere. And um, it's one that he's driving quite hard, basically. It's just make it available and get my people to work anywhere. Uh, the two different journeys which these two will take, um, we will see that one has gone on a pathway of APAS, and the other one has gone on a path pathway of software as a service. So Richard is the first one who will be coming up, and he'll be talking about what he's doing in his particular organization. And uh, yeah, with you, Richard, you always be prepared to be challenged. Thanks, Richard. <laughs> Well, good morning. Uh, it's great to be here. I wish I had more than 10 minutes because I could talk about some of the other exciting things we're doing, but um, I'm honoured to be able to speak about this. So Fire and Rescue New South Wales, it's one of the largest uh, fire and rescue organisations on the planet. Certainly the busiest in Australia, with a truck going out the door every four minutes. And we protect all of you, and of course my family as well, from fire, flood, storm, and basically whatever you need rescuing and everything else. Um, the Fire and Rescue New South Wales IT department is, uh, has a reputation for innovation. That's driven by the need to just get out there and do it. So it's a real can-do department because uh, we're fighting the tyranny of death and destruction and we know what that means, and even recently. Um, and we go overseas and help there too. So we've got to have systems that are extremely reliable and can do all of this. Now, Fire and Rescue New South Wales also provides the, uh, the core systems uh, including SAP for a number of other agencies uh, in the emergency services sector and the justice cluster. And it currently supports 100,000 staff and volunteers, making it one of the largest uh, SAP systems in government. It also manages uh, half a million pieces of equipment, thousands of vehicles, and has all the modules. And it's the latest version running on HANA. It was the first, uh, I think, SAP ERP to run on HANA in the, in the Southern Hemisphere. So we like being at the leading edge. We believe in the power of the integration that an ERP brings. Doesn't mean we want to actually log into it and use it. Uh, best way to use an ERP is to use something else that accesses it. But we do believe in the power of the integration that it brings. And I recognise Gavin Brown and his team for having got us to this stage. So why, why did we go to Platform as a Service, an otherwise conservative organisation? Um, we, like most agencies, have always owned and operated our own kit. But it's been getting harder and harder to do that. 
with a, a small to medium team, lean and mean, keeping up with the technology, uh, 24 by 7 support, the complexity, uh, the team was progressively being smashed. They wanted some relief, they wanted an answer. Um, the corporate infrastructure, all of our storage and everything on that side of the business was starting to get to end of life. And so we needed something, and, and we're get coming into capacity issues, so we had to replace it. So were we going to replace it with what we had before, or were we going to do something just slightly innovative? And of course, we're going to do something innovative. Um, our strategy is to move to as a service for as much as we possibly can. Um, because we understand that we can exploit the, efficiency, the scale efficiencies and the technical capabilities of the private sector. However, there's been a number of challenges for us doing this, to be no, honest. Back in 2013, uh, GovDC was new. Could it actually provide the services that we needed? Um, was the industry ready to provide those services? Well, it was a bit, you know, wa wavering there. Um, also, we had no particular budget to do this, and especially not a recurrent budget. Even if we had capital, that wasn't going to uh, help a huge amount. So, we needed an aggressive approach, because we weren't going to buy another lot of kit and live another five years like we were before. So what was our approach? Um, obviously, the internal team did not have the capacity, uh, and nor the commercial acumen, uh, to pull off such a, such a large venture. So we hired uh, Matt Carroll and his team from Rightway, uh, an independent team, unfettered by business as usual, uh, to, to pull it off. And I can't underestimate the need to have an unfettered, capable team dedicated to the task, uh, to pull off such a complicated task. So the discovery phase uh, took two months because, to be honest, we hadn't documented everything quite as well as we needed to, and you've got to have a very clear view of your, your current state. We then did a, an EOI to 65 vendors on the ICT services scheme and GovDC providers list, so basically everybody. We got 27 responses and shortlisted that to eight for an RFP. So we did an RFP for as a service, managed service, private cloud, hybrid. Hey, we were open to it. Just tell us what you can do. We got six responses and uh, basically it was obvious that infrastructure as a service, though somewhat new at that time, was the way to go, the best bang for buck and a whole lot of advantages. As it turned out, we went with platform as a service, which is one layer higher. So basically we get our operating systems provisioned for us, we just have to load the software. Now in parallel with all that, we did a design phase, which itself took five months. Um, and so from the very beginning to when we said, hey, we've got to do this, to when we're live and actually in GovDC running, uh, took 17 months. So what's the solution that we have? It, uh, IBM won, won the tender. Uh, we have platform as a service from the marketplace, and I believe we were first to be in the marketplace in GovDC. So we've got proud of that too. Um, we, because our, our SAP ERP runs on HANA, we had already bought some Dell boxes to run that on, and we didn't want to just throw them away. So part of the contract was for IBM to manage those on the side, which was good. Uh, network services from the managed services backbone, of course, and we've ended up with a modern, scalable, powerful infrastructure, uh, many times faster than what we had before, and to be quite honest, many times faster than we could have ever dreamed to have. It's amazingly powerful kit, which is lovely. So straight away, we, I think we've got a three times boost on average on everything, even before we hardly uh, started tuning it. We have one throat to choke, so all the data centre costs, uh, network servers and all that, uh, goes through the IBM contract, including, of course, the 24 by 7 proactive support, which we now have, uh, disaster recovery, management and testing. Uh, Fire and Rescue has the capability through a portal to create VMs on demand and uh, add extra storage, so it's very elastic, which is lovely. Uh, their change management is integrated with our change management. Uh, we get ITIL uh, 3 and 27001, all that good stuff. And we actually, uh, toward the end, asked for antivirus because we thought, why the hell are we doing this? You do it. Um, <laughs> um, and just to cap it all off, uh, we put a uh, 10 gigabit dark fibre ring right across the metro area connecting all our major sites. So how lovely is that? No, the net no network congestion, I can assure you. And that connects us to all the data centres with diverse path, um, blah, 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 all good. So. Um, in terms of the commercials, uh, we obviously work very closely with OFS, as it was called then, 
with Pedro and Paul and their teams, for which we're very grateful. We ended up with a, a capped price per resource unit. So resource units made up of uh, VM, CPU, memory, uh, storage, etc. And that's locked in for five years. In, incidentally, uh, that price for the next five years is about the same as what we've been paying the last six years, except we've got like that much more of everything. Um, so that means that my budget uh, could pay for it, which was excellent. Um, we helped, uh, in working with OFS, of course, we helped them initiate the contracts, which now other agencies can leverage, not have to go through uh, all of that. And we got passed through of Gov GovDC costs, uh, including the power and the network and everything else. Um, the resource units have a ceiling and a floor, which is quite, quite wide. So we can expand into that. We can uh, peel stuff off into other clouds over the next five years without really uh, impacting uh, the contract or the cost, which is excellent. And all of this has enabled Fire and Rescue New South Wales to provide SAP services, not only to itself, but to its client agencies within the justice cluster at definitely the lowest cost in government, which we're also excited about. So just to finish off, uh, that went quickly, um, we've ended up with a uh, platform as a service more powerful than we could have ever dreamed of and with 24 by 7 support, fixed for five years, flexible, elastic, one throat to choke, super fast connectivity, but not just between our own sites and the data centres, but now through the backbone to any other government agency that we require to connect to. We've now gone from some facilities that may have been a three out of five to now one of the top, I believe, top 20 data centres in the world. We've got two of them. And Fire and Rescue is beautifully positioned uh, in the right place at the right time and with the right strategy. Thank you. In your, in your handouts, as Aaron comes up, um, at the back of it, you've got an outline of what's in category of four, which is what Richard has spoken about. So there's a whole range of providers, which you'll see a little later on when we do a search in the catalog, who's available on category of four as uh, what services are provided. <coughs> Aaron is not going to be talking about what's available in category of three, but I'll hand it over to you. Thanks, Aaron. Thanks, Pedro. Okay. Uh, thanks, everyone, for the opportunity to speak to you today. Um, look, we've, um, we, before I go off into the case study and presentation, I want to acknowledge the, the collaboration that's taken us to this point. Um, there's been a, a lot of people, um, some of those in the room around the broader team and our partners at Censure in this journey, as well as OFS and, and our legal partners and, and procurement partners in getting this um, to where we are today. So Department of Justice is a, a fairly large and complex organisation. So uh, we look after all the jails, the courts, we've got trustee and guardian, we've got all, approximately 47 business units, very diverse. Um, but also getting more diverse. So um, recently we've inherited um, liquor and gaming and racing, as well as some of the cultural institutions. Um, so we've got everything from Long Bay Jail to the Opera House, and people that are trying to keep people from gambling to people that are trying to encourage people to gamble more for revenue purposes. <laughs> so a fairly large and complex organisation. So the challenge then is how do we get that system of record or that ERP system um, and baseline um, services with all that diversity and supporting um, a complex business. So um, I'll go off to the um, next slide and I'll take you through that journey. Okay. So look, the, the first thing that we wanted to do was to put on the table some of these key design principles. And this, these key design principles really shape what we were trying to achieve out of the solution. So taking some of the, the input from Gartner, OFS, um, um, procurement within OFS, and some of the, the, the I guess, the leaders from um, the leading thought from the New South Wales Government ICT strategy is we wanted to put together and put out there into a market uh, a, a process where we, we, we tested those principles and made sure we achieved those. One of those key ones is as a service. So our ICT strategy is everything eventually as a service. So how do we move an ERP capability, um, something that's been traditionally delivered on premise um, in, a, in a model that um, is, is not attuned to as a service, to an as a service model. So that's one of the key design principles. The next one was CSSR compliance. So we in government like to think that we're very different, but in essence, um, as, as Denise had likely put, there's a lot of things such as procure to pay, 
payroll type things that don't really separate us, um, don't really differentiate us and, and can be harmonised and unified. And we've got multiple business processes, many ways to do those things at the moment. How do we get to a standard? So the corporate and shared services standard provided a framework for us to consolidate our business processes to a common platform. And that's a critical thing that, that relates later to that as a service delivery model, which I'll go into more detail. The other key aspect is Procure IT 3.1. So Paul and his team have put a lot of effort in establishing a, a very robust framework for procuring services and with, um, you know, with the, the evolution of Category Q um, within Pedro's area is, is the, the ability to build that marketplace. So one of those key principles is we wanted to leverage and make sure that we use um, Procure IT as a framework, not only for our benefit, but for those that follow us so that it is easy to do business with government and that those government risks and those, those elements within that Procure IT framework that manage those government risks are taken forward as well. The other aspect um, was that um, there's a lot of stranded assets within the, the ERP um, area within government, in particular licences. So um, you know, we're, we're going on an SAP journey and there's within uh, government a lot of stranded license assets under the GSAS arrangements, um, some very beneficial ones, so we didn't want to lose those benefits as well. So to be able to have that license portability in and out was a, an important key principle uh, for us moving forward. And we also wanted to make sure that we contribute to the marketplace. So one of those key principles was to establish it in GovDC, but also align it to the emerging category Q. And GovDC wasn't just a, a principle, um, but we wanted to make sure we invested in um, the, the capability within GovDC as a principle. But beyond that principle was also that the GovDC environment gave us a simplification of connectivity, gave us simplification of information security certification, data sovereignty, and all of those elements that GovDC brings with it. So it's not just the principle of just getting it into the, the Kennards for Government kit, um, it's really around making sure that that marketplace meets those broader um, requirements as well. And the last but not least is risk. Um, so how do you kind of move to an as-a-service delivery model for something that's a strategic capability like an ERP? How do you manage risk? How do you make sure that all the benefits of as-a-service, which is scalability, elasticity, um, ease of entry and ease of exit, are maintained, but also the risk of things that could go wrong in that model. So what if the, the vendors decide to exit the market? Where does it leave you? Um, what about the IP and all of the elements that, that are contributing into that, um, into that framework? So, you know, I use an analogy of um, um, that we've had a, another as-a-service implementation around offender electronic monitoring, um, and that's in, in an as-a-service model. Um, if you turn that off, um, and the vendor goes um, bust overnight, you know where the offenders were <laughs> yesterday, but you won't know where they are tomorrow. So how do we manage those risks in those kind of use cases, um, and particularly across government that, um, that as a service provides challenges for? Okay, so what is the solution that we're actually going to? Um, so at the core of the solution, uh, Accenture, our partners in this journey, is really just an SAP ECC6 environment. So similar to what's been described, that system of record, that core ERP capability is finance, HR, asset management, that core capability. So nothing really terribly innovative from a technology perspective around that. Um, but what is innovative is the stuff around the edge and how we procured it, how we've structured it and how we're consuming it. So in particular, um, one of the, the, the key innovations is an as-a-service delivery model around that ERP solution. So making sure we've got fairly robust SLAs, because we didn't have the internal capability capacity to take on uh, a lot of this um, amalgamation and consolidation. How do we put strong SLAs around um, the management of, of that environment? And also having a, a fairly clear service catalogue that enables us to, I guess, onboard and offboard various ERP capabilities in a, in a fairly seamless manner, but also have very good visibility around what that costs um, moving forward. The other key innovation was that um, to, we wanted to make sure that it complied with the CSSR blueprint. So as, a, as a, um, a key principle, we wanted to make sure we consolidated all our business processes on the government standard, and how do we ensure that that, that solution um, Put, put, puts that in place is this concept of adopt and adapt, which I'll go into a little bit more detail around the next slide. The other key aspect is to establish it in as a multi-tenanted environment, so it's not just for us, 
it's reusable for the rest of government, um, New South Wales government, but also potentially beyond. And it's a platform that stood up within the government data centre um, on a HANA platform and also um, is, is back, uh, I guess, um, um, back delivered through to Accenture as a platform as a service through NTT. So re relatively speaking, the environment there is scalable and true platform as a service cloud underneath with the solution, um, which is the AS, uh, AESG solution over the top. And then the other key element is the innovation roadmap, both functional and technical. So the, the aspect of that is that we wanted to procure this solution as an enduring solution. So all the benefits of SaaS of software currency, so upgrades, SAP upgrades, various other technical upgrades, all baked into that as a single capability in a single contract, as a single service, but also a functional um, innovation roadmap. So as the government CSSR standards evolve, um, as things like the government employee number come into play, if new tax rates come in, new pay um, um, uh, flex agreements and various other things come in, how does that functional change in relation to how that solution is put together also be baked into the solution as a service so that we don't have to worry about it? So in a traditional sense, if we had a, um, an internal um, SAP solution and the government employee number came on board, we'd have to invest resources in actually implementing that. How do we make that baked in as part of the service? So the other, the, the key concept of, and I think this is the, the key aspect, and we spent a lot of time with Accenture co-designing this, um, is the, the, the concept of understanding how we can adapt our processes, adopt the standard processes, but adapt the solution to that, that layer of differentiation where the ERP starts moving into. So there's this 10%, 90% um, concept of adapt and adopt, where 90% of, um, of the solution we can adopt is a pre-blueprinted CSSR-based solution. S processes around procure to pay, um, um, onboarding, offboarding, payroll, etc. we should be able to just adopt those CSSR standard government processes around those. Then there's a, an element where there might be some differentiation, something that's specific to our agency or a tenant that needs to be adapted. So that could be a, a, a small customization, a specific report, a specific workflow. So what we do, with what the, the, the success of this um, is, is the, the, the SaaS solution is based on is this budget of 90% adopt and 10% adapt. And within that adopt component is everything that is whole of government standard. So even new changes to the CSSR standard, new capabilities coming on board is part of that adopt. And as long as you keep within the 10%, 90% budget around adopt, adapt, it's all inclusive within that service. If we then divert from that, and there might be reasons to do that, there's a service catalog that handles that diversion from that 90 to 10%. And that is then very transparently costed, which gives the business, I guess, um, price triggers and cost triggers around moving away from standard and moving to that down that customization track. So it really kind of um, makes sure that uh, from, a, from a business perspective, we've, we've got a mind on making sure that we um, adapt um, or adopt the standard and, and minimise the, the, the variation or customisation of our solution. And this is also important to make this viable from the vendor's perspective because there's, um, there's no um, economies of scale once everyone's tenancy around a, a multi-tenant solution varies widely. The next key element was that um, I, I indicated earlier there's not real too much technical innovation at the core, it's SAP ECC6 as a solution. But the, the co-design and the collaboration of, of the process was mostly around the commercial and the procurement vehicle. So we engineered the, co uh, the, the contract and co-designed the solution with an eye on business continuity, on service viability and value for money. The innovations weren't technical, they were commercial. And one of those, those there's, there's a, a number of details in there, but, um, but certainly at the, at the main area is, is around no hidden extras. So we engage with our, our counterparts at, at Trade and Investment, Singapore Government, um, Family Community Services to, to understand how, what are some of the lessons learned around those uh, implementations and, and some of those key lessons have been brought into that contract. One of the key principles was defining very clearly this adopt-adapt 
concept and also the service catalogue. So there's no hidden extras so that we know what we're buying and what is the, you know, as a service, um, the concept of what that is and what is um, the cost if we step outside of those bounds to make sure that the, the price is truly um, reflective of what we're buying. The other key aspect is with as a service comes a risk. So orderly exit. So in, in, in uh, counterparts with Accenture, I guess the, the prevailing theme was we're working on the prenup here. Um, we're getting into a partnership and marriage, but we need to understand what are the risks around exiting out. So there's a number of scenarios, for example, in the contract where if um, for, for whatever reason Accenture exits the market, um, we get, um, I guess, escrow over the IP and the solution, the SAP export, and we can then deploy it on another vendor or on-premise. So some of those controls in place um, that, that were mutually agreed and mutually negotiated to ensure that we manage our risk, but the vendor also manages their risk commercially. And then the other key aspect is performance. So a lot of work went into the SLA and the surface level agreement to make sure that um, management of the performance of, of, of what that service provides us um, met our needs um, as a government provider. And some of those um, were within the Procure IT framework generally. Others were negotiated much more detail in, in, in terms of the SLAs. So last slide is where we're kind of going from to going to. So on the um, left-hand side, there is our kind of current environment. We've got everything under the sun. We've got Orion HR. We've got, um, um, you know, um, in, um, in-house custom developed rostering solutions. We've got SAP in, in um, former fax business link. We've got Mincom ERP. Um, we've got SAP in fire and rescue, various other things. And we've got multiple business processes. So, so, you know, this is a simplified view, but we've got juvenile justice business processes, corrective services business processes, formerly, former attorney generals business processes. So how do we bring all that together and move to a postmodern ERP, as the, the term is called? So our journey has started. At the core will be that system of record, that core ERP delivered in an as-a-service model. The basis that pulls all that together is that, um, that purple line, which is that, that CSSRP, whole of government standard business processes. Around it, we'll build a, a loosely integrated ecosystem of, of other solutions. So um, um, procurement and contract management, um, human capital management, workforce scheduling, um, BI, um, et cetera, and those plugging in um, to, that, to that ecosystem. But the, the journey that we're starting on at the moment is that ERP piece in the middle and moving that to an as a service. Okay, thank you. Thanks, Aaron and um, Richard. If, uh, like me, I find that really exciting and really inspiring. Um, and, and part of it for me is thinking about when we set about making reform and policy change and we think about what we need to do in the system, that's the start of that journey. So to see how that's been fulfilled through the work that Richard and Aaron have been doing and how they've really challenged and stretched us to think about new systems and ways of delivering what we need, both from a procurement point of view, but also in our engagement with industry and our collaboration across the sector as a whole, I I think is really, really exciting. So thank you very much. I really appreciated your case studies today.